Well, we welcome up the next speaker, who is Matthias Friedal. Uh, Matthias will be speaking about 1.5 consistent pathways and whether they are possible. Uh, Matthias is a research fellow at the Center for Climate Science and Policy Research here at Linköping University. Or Linköping, what would you, what would you say in English? Uh, Linköping. Linköping. <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> I tried. Uh, and in your research, you've had a special focus on international climate policy. Apparently, you've been to more than 20 of these international climate negotiations. I do not envy you. Uh, and in particular, you've had a focus on negative emissions, uh, which play a very big role in the IPCC's 1.5 degree report. Mm. So we are looking forward to hearing more about this now. So the yep. stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Okay, so I'm going to dive right into this uh, directly, uh, giving you a glimpse of the scenarios or the pathways to 1.5. Uh, and when you do that, you want typically to have a likelihood as associated with the target or the goal. If you want to reach 1.5, I'm going to talk about 66% <coughs> sorry, likelihood of meeting the 1.5 degree goal. So uh, you can have different kinds of likelihoods uh, associated with uh, meeting the goal. I, I've selected this one to, um, to uh, talk about something called a carbon budget. So if you have this, uh, you have a goal and you have a likelihood with which you want to meet the goal, you can talk about uh, carbon budgets. And carbon budgets basically means the amount of emissions you can put into the atmosphere before you have induced uh, a 1.5 degree warming. Um, I will take the carbon budgets from the special report on 1.5 degrees. You have many different carbon budgets out there. I'm going to talk about these budgets, uh, which gives us, uh, in, since pre-industrial times, up until 2100, when we want to evaluate whether we meet the goal or not, it gives us a budget of 2,620 gigatons, uh, plus or minus. And I'm not going to talk about uncertainties a whole lot, but there are many and great uncertainties associated with carbon budgets. Uh, so when you, when you think or when you read into the report, you have to think about these budgets. It may be, or these uncertainties, it may be that we have already blown the carbon budget for 1.5 degrees, or it may be that it's a bit larger or bigger than I, the one I'll talk about. Uh, but they are many, these uncertainties. But let's take the median then uh, scenario, 2,620 gigatons. Um, by today, 2017, we have already emitted 2,200 gigatons. Uh, and with current emission rates of about 42 gigatons per year, if they are unabated, but also if they don't increase in the coming decade, we will have depleted this budget in 10 years, by 2028. Uh, so it's a short time span, and even in the idealized world of climate integrated assessment models, uh, we cannot achieve zero emissions by 2028. It's uh, practically infeasible, in a sense. Okay, so what the models do is they introduce a period of lending, a period of, of emitting more than the carbon budget allows, uh, basically running into a budget deficit. Uh, and by 2050, roughly, uh, we are achieving net zero emissions in most of the scenarios that take us to 1.5 degree warming. Uh, and after 2050, we have to pay back. We have to start removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, basically. Uh, a, a challenging task. Uh, the way we do this is through something called bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BEX. Uh, this is currently an uncommercial technology and relatively unproven technology, but it has to be, in most of the scenarios, upscaled dramatically. We also need to afforestate. Uh, we need afforestation. Okay, so we need to move from deforestation rates to global afforestation rates, basically, to suck up carbon from the atmosphere. Okay? Uh, the scale in, by which this is done is in the order of 100 to 1,000 gigatons. So the more extreme of these scenarios, they apply a huge amount of this kind of lending from the future generations. Uh, okay, and why is the span so big? Uh, this has to do with a broad range of scenarios. So I'm going to show you two illustrative models or two illustrative scenarios, basically, on the far 
uh, sort of extremes of, of the scenario landscape. This one uh, is the most ambitious one, or one of the most ambitious ones, when it comes to immediate mitigation action. So if you reduce emissions in the coming de decade very, very dramatically, uh, then you will not have to rely on so many negative emissions in the future, basically. In this scenario, you don't, you don't even have to apply BECs at all. Uh, you can do with afforestation only. But it also means that the energy demand in these scenarios re are reduced dramatically. The energy system is actually shrinking in these kinds of scenarios. On the other end of the scenario, or different scenarios, you have typically these kinds of scenarios. With continued path dependency, you continue to, uh, to uh, demand en energy at similar scales as today, and, and you eat the same kind of food or even more meat in the future, and so on and so forth. You have uncoordinated international politics, uh, which will create a need for technological fixes in the future and a much higher dependency on bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. But in both of these cases, we do meet in, the, in these scenarios the 1.5 degree goal. So it's theoretically possible to achieve it in many different ways, according to the scenarios. The question is if it's practically feasible, if, it's, uh, if there are political preconditions for this and social preconditions. And if you start looking into this, uh, on this graph you have the different scenarios I showed you before, the, the two extremes and all the scenarios in between that are as assessed by the uh, 1.5 degree report. Um, most of them, or almost all of them, say that we need to achieve net zero emissions by roughly 2050. The most ambitious climate uh, target we have in the world today is the Swedish one. It's by far the most ambitious climate target. It achieves net zero, if, if we fulfill it, it achieves net zero emissions by 2045. Roughly the same as what's requested on global scale to meet the 1.5 degree goal in these scenarios. Okay, another way of looking into this is to look at the nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement that Marco spoke about. Uh, if you look at the collective ambition of these, it takes us somewhere between 50 to 58 gigatons in the period 2020 to 2030. We are, are, if we do everything we promise in the world, we are actually going to increase emissions. Uh, that's the contributions to the Paris Agreement. And it's very different from the, the idealized the scenario pathway, the cost-efficient uh, pathways uh, in the scenarios. Actually, in the IPCC report, there is also one section looking into the so-called emission gap by 2030. If you consider uh, a full implementation of NDCs, the most ambitious implementation of them, and then compare it to the median scenario for 1.5 degrees Celsius, you have an emission gap of a, approximately 27 gigatons. So the longer we postpone mitigation, the more we have to rely on negative emissions in the future. That's basically the, 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 the key takeaway message of this. And the harder, the, the more problematic it will be to achieve 1.5. So it's theoretically possible, but it's also very, very... Uh, uh, it demands a lot from politics and, and from societies to be able to make this transformation. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Matthias. Uh, and before I let you sit down again, I want to ask you just one follow-up question on the last slide. Mm -hmm. You're saying it's theoretically possible, but very challenging to realize. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the biggest challenge? Uh, <laughs> the fact that the, the scenarios do not... Uh, they are not very good at capturing the political and social dimension of transformation. Uh, and the key challenge, I suspect, is not in technology and economics, it's probably in, in uh, achieving this or putting the right political framework in place in order to, to uh, achieve these scenarios and also to build social acceptance for these kinds of, of uh, pathways or, mm. or strong political requirements that mm. we have to have to, to achieve them. Uh, I'm quite sure we will get back to just that area a bit later by one of the other speakers. Uh, but another question, uh, this might be a leading one, mm -hmm. but uh, this is a Nordic climate adaptation conference. And I checked it up, and Denmark has a goal of being a low emission society by 2050. 
Iceland has a goal of 50 to 75 percent emission reductions compared to 1990. Uh, Finland and Norway uh, are in line with the EU's EU-wide target of a- at least 80 percent up to 95 percent reduction by 2050. And Sweden, as you mentioned, has a net zero by 2045. Is this enough? <laughs> For 1.5, it's not enough. Uh, and and uh, I mean, also the Swedish goal is not enough. Uh, e- you, you have to sort of create space for countries like China, Brazil, South Africa. You mentioned the, the administration in the United States right now. Countries that are far from as, um, uh, as ambitious as uh, the Nordic countries, you need to create space for them to, to catch up eventually also. Mm. So, no, it's not enough. Okay. So we have a bit more to work on. Yeah. But thank you again for your presentation, Matthias. So yeah. please take your seat. Thanks. Um,